picture out on the breeze See the light through the trees Shows over the same old story Good evening, everyone. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind you to silence your cell phones and any electronic devices that you may have. 
And also we have provided a sign language interpreter on stage left here. So anyone who's having trouble viewing the interpreter, if you would kindly move to this side of the auditorium and find an empty seat. Um, and we'd be happy to assist you with that. So we'll begin in a couple of minutes. So if folks can start to take their seats, um, we will start the show very soon. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the 10th annual Rudolfo and Patricia Anaya Lecture on the Literature of the Southwest featuring U.S. Poet Laureate Joy Harjo. I'm Dr. Melina Vizcaino Aleman, an associate professor in the English department at UNM. And I'm honored to host this special event. 
First, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for all of your understanding and patience as we navigate a new normal and figure out collectively how to gather during a pandemic in celebration of poetry and life in the Southwest. Thanks also to the graduate students who stepped up to help, and I ask that you make room for them as they make... <laughs> as they make their way to their seats in the next 10 minutes or so. A special thanks to Dr. Anita Obermeyer, Chair of the English Depart Department and Associate Provost Pamela Cheek for all their support and coordination. To our UNM co-sponsors, the College of Arts and Sciences, Graduate Studies, the Center for Regional Studies, the Departments of Native American Studies and Chicana Chicano Studies, as well as the Institute for American Indian Research and the Feminist Research Institute. We could not continue this programming without your co-sponsorship. A hearty thank you. I also owe a debt of gratitude to our partners at the NHCC here, especially Andres Martinez and Reeve Love, and to the English Department staff, especially Ryan Davis and Claudia Gans, as well as my honorary committee member and partner in crime, Associate Dean and Professor Jesse Aleman. Thank you also to my committee members, especially Susan McAllister, who has put so much invisible labor into making this event special. She created the beautiful program in front of you, and I'd like to take a minute to make a donation plea, if you can please open up your programs to the first page. We are currently working to dedicate a space in Zimmerman Library at UNM in honor of Mr. Anaya. Please consider making a donation to the Rulofo Anaya Sala Fund. We're slowly inching our way up to our goal, but we still have a long way to go. Please help us make this dream a reality by donating today. We've provided the QR codes in our program with links to the UNM Foundation's giving page and to our crowdfunding page. Thanks so much to Carol Kennedy uh, with the UNM Foundation for making this effort possible and to Belinda Henry, Rudy's beloved niece and tireless advocate who has become such a dear friend to me over the past year. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Anaya's family in the audience and ask everyone to remember Mr. Anaya on his birthday this year and every year, October 30th. Finally, I'd like to thank Roberta Rael, Director of Generation Justice, who along, <laughs> who along with her team of youth journalists hosted me on two occasions to promote our event during their weekly radio program that airs at 7 p.m. on KUNM KNW 89.9 FM. As a side note, Roberta and I have been neighbors for 20 years, and we've been talking about partnering for at least the past 10. It doesn't surprise me that Mr. Anaya continues to bring people together in love, friendship, and fellowship. In April, Generation Justice and Spoken Word Hour hosted a poetry uh, special honoring Mr. Anaya. Many thanks to Damien Flores, host of Spoken Word, for partnering with us during this program. I had the opportunity to meet Tanaya Winder, who will introduce our distinguished speaker tonight. Tanaya is a Duckwater Shoshone, Pyramid, Pyramid Lake Paiute, and Southern Ute poet, artist, an educator with a BA from Stanford University and an MFA from our very own English department at UNM, where she compiled a collection of poems that develop motifs of music, birds, and winter to explore themes of loss and historical and contemporary trauma within indigenous communities. Tanaya is the author of Words Like Me, first published in 2015 by West End Press and re reissued this year by UNM Press. She is also the co-editor of the 2011 collection, Soul Talk, Song Language, Conversations with Joy Harjo. She lent her voice to Joy's signature poet laureate project, Living Nations, Living Words, part of the Library of Congress American Folk Life Center and available to listen online. 
Tanaya's words and Joy's work remind us that Native peoples are this land's first peoples, and they continue to endure despite efforts to erase their history and memory. I'm honored to bring you this event during Native American Heritage Month and on the heels of Indigenous Peoples Day. May we always remember that these lands are the ancestral homelands of the Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache people who have since time immemorial had deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. Let us remember that Native American history is all of our history and that we should learn from the lessons of the past as well as listen to the voices in the present. On that note, please help me welcome Tanaya Winder to the stage. Welcome and good evening, everyone. Tonight, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce this year's featured speaker for the 10th annual Rodolfo and Patricia Naya Lecture on the Literature of the Southwest. We begin with breath, made into sound, song, and story, and hers was birthed on wings of night sky, wings of morning light that sped across the Muscogee Creek land, flowered with Indian blankets. Brightly woven red and orange centers their yellow tips, fire wheels. They said at dawn prayers were offered to an American sunrise, and finally the sun opened petal by petal to reveal a doorway known as poetry through which she entered. I was first introduced to this poet warrior in between pages I dog-eared during my senior year at Stanford when I was learning how we became human. Page after page, poem after poem, I found words I didn't even know I needed. Lovingly, I ran my fingers across the words, their sacred vibrations echoed through my creator-shaped hole, and I was made whole. I felt seen. I never knew this kind of writing was possible, the kind where a poem is a heart beating itself into living and loving again and again and again. It was then I realized poetry could be just like the stories I heard growing up, that just like our oral history and traditions, a poem could remove the partitions that exist between worlds. My professor then brought joy to Stanford, and I witnessed firsthand her crazy brave magic through her stories that spilled out of her saxophone and the tales embedded in the tones of her everybody has a heartache blues. You see, I had a heartache too. I was that woman who fell from the sky, a blurred vision of bitter and sweet, a husk of a spirit splintered by grief, but her words poemed me into breathing again. Her words made me want to burn brightly, and for a girl just becoming a poet, I knew I needed to learn how words could make meaning mean something again. So I applied to the MFA program at the University of New Mexico, ready to pen a map to the next world of myself and who I was before when my ancestors prayed and sang in their own soul talk song language. Joy made the writing workshop feel like a writing home, a place where we belonged and didn't have to leave our indigeneity at the door. We could bring our ancestors' voices into the room each time we entered, and we did. In our first class, we were asked to compile a list of our poetry ancestors whose writing had influenced us in our craft and who influenced our ancestors before that. We traced our way back through the spiral of memory as far as we could reach, and in that stretching, we saw how our own star fit into the constellation of story. As songbirds, she encouraged us to sing, bring music and lyric into our creations. We'd work alone and in pairs, and I remember riding along to Nina Simone's stars. They come and go, they come fast and slow. And in her blaze, Joy brought along as many as she could. In my first year of graduate school, Joy gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. She asked me to help her on her next book, a collection of interviews. I was able to make it into an independent study, but it was really a course on life advice, where little did I know Joy was leaving me guideposts I could follow into the future to light my way. I thought I was doing it just for the experience, 
But Joy brought me along for the, for the entire ride, from meeting the publisher to advocating for me to have my name put on the cover as co-editor. Same size, no hierarchy. I had no words. Never before had a mentor been so generous and real. She even made sure they put my photo on the back flap with hers. Joy is generous like that. And I marked that memory on my lifetime map so that one day I could return there. When I was able to pay it forward to another indigenous poet, I would be just as giving as Joy. In that opportunity, she gave me my first book publication. It was a gift that opened many worlds. And Joy continues to open worlds for others in the opportunities she gives and the creations she makes, like her Norton Anthology of Native Nations Poetry, the first historically comprehensive Native poetry anthology featuring more than 160 poets representing nearly 100 indigenous nations, or her Living Nations, Living Words Anthology, an interactive map, story map published by the Library of Congress. There are so many things I want to say, that Joy served on my dissertation committee, and that even though she was busy, she made time to give me important feedback, like take risks in my writing and not hold back. I could tell you that she was generous with her time, connecting on a personal level and not just in the classroom. I consider her a dear friend. Joy is a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation and an award-winning writer, performer, and saxophone player. She has published nine books of poetry, two memoirs and children's books, and six CDs. In 2019, she was named the 23rd U.S. Poet Laureate, the nation's first Native American to receive such an honor. She was reappointed to a second term. Yep, let's give it up for that. <laughs> Not only that, but she was reappointed to a second term in April 2020 and a third term in November 2020. Only one other poet has that d distinguishment. Her prestigious awards include the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, the Academy of American Poets Wallace Stevens Award, a Penn U.S. Literary Award for nonfiction, two National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She is Chancellor for the Academy of American Poets and Chair of the Board of Directors for the Native Arts and Culture Foundation and currently holds a Tulsa Artist Fellowship. Joy, thank you for leading the way for so many of us in this language life. Thank you for your words and your grace. Keep running towards the stories that want to be written. Everyone, please join me in welcoming U.S. Poet Laureate Joy Harjo. <laughs> Mado, thank you, Tanea and Melina. And uh, we have a nice interpreter here whose name I don't know and who has seen none of my work ahead of time. I apologize. <laughs> but I often change things around. So um, anyway, I'm really happy to be here, especially to honor. I see this as an honoring of Rudy and Naya, Patricia and Naya, and uh, the, the work and the contributions they made for the culture and the peoples of New Mexico and the world. Um, so I'm going to start out with a welcoming song. I mean, you were welcoming me, me, a really warm welcome. I love the way you were welcoming everybody. So maybe we should welcome the audience. <laughs> Yay, thank you for being here. <laughs> so I asked my cousin, I said, you know, I travel a lot and go places. And I, first I should say that I'm Henje Stongo, Joy Harjo, Chio Chief Geros. I'm um, from the Muscogee Creek Nation. I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I come here from Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Muscogee Creek Nation Reservation. And um, a member of OG Abova Ceremonial Ground. And I'm happy to be here. My children live here. 
I'm a dual citizen of, t of Oklahoma and New Mexico. <laughs> And I have long associations with Albuquerque University of New Mexico and, um, and this whole, the whole Southwest. But I asked my cousin, you know what, I need to get a pen. I have to write notes. Hang on just a second. <laughs> I told Malene, I said, we better put my bag here because I have a feeling I'm going to need something <laughs> from it. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I asked my cousin, Jill Sulfur, I said, you know, I travel a lot, and is there a song you could teach me to, uh, um, to, uh, for when I travel? Because, you know, I travel all over, and it's, I think it's important to remember our languages and to honor them. And by doing so, you know, to um, bring them, you know, none of us are alone. Yes, we are alone, very existentially alone. But at the same time, we're part of a whole ancestry, uh, familial uh, ancestry, poetry ancestors, you know, and community ancestors and so on. And so in a way, it's a way to, of inter it's kind of an introduction, but it also says that, you know, I love my people and by singing, and being with this song, then they are also here with me. It's called Ale Nale No. We'll see if this works. Here we go. This song was taught to me by my cousin Jill Sulphur, and it's a welcoming song saying something like, we were brought here by the old ones. They are always watching out for us. Ale na le no. Ale na le no. Ale na le no. Ale na le no. Easily need to call it. Ale na le no. Ale no le no. Ho bunny, ho bunny. Ale no le no. Ale no le no. Aja lugi magongi. Ale no le no. Hey young people. We're here to celebrate life. It is so short, and we're put here to love and take care of each other. So, Hobany, Hobany, let's dance.
So that was Joe. I'm honored to be here on behalf of Rudy and Patricia Anaya, who always supported New Mexico writers. They're still supporting New Mexico writers and the community, especially students, and have left the legacy of this series. This is not the first time I've benefited from Rudy Anaya. I took a fiction class from him when I was an undergrad at UNM. He was a deliberate, careful teacher not showy, and he taught that there was a reason for stories, a usefulness. Stories could be uh, for illuminating the mysterious that weaves the most complicated struggles into beauty. Bless Me Ultima, his classic novel, proved this. He was a listener. He and other professors at UNM helped incubate a profound and prolific literary legacy that includes so many of us who were brought into the circle in the 1970s and continue to be brought into the circle. I studied poetry under David Johnson. He was my, uh, my first poetry class ever was with David Johnson at UNM in 1972. His tremendous love of poetry made his students enthusiasts. He helped to turn me in the direction of poetry. I experienced how poetry mattered. I next took classes from Jean Frumpkin. My first class with Jean was English 322 Poetry Writing Workshop. He treated his students as fellow travelers in the field of poetry. The usually unspoken part of teaching is creating and holding a space for students to feel, to free, free, feel free to think, dream, study, and experiment. This characterized my creative writing classes at UNM. I also took a fiction workshop with Leslie Silco, um, the um, Laguna poet, writer, novelist, when she taught at UNM. And through her, I met so many people. I met May May Bersenbrugge and Ishmael Reed and all of them had a profound effect on my development as a poet and writer. Leslie later taught briefly at the University of Arizona but stopped teaching because, as she was heard to say, she would rather dance naked in the middle of Speedway than teach in a university. <laughs> I love that about Leslie. <laughs> she was a good teacher. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so my first poems ever were published in the student magazine. It used to be called The Thunderbird. And I have looked it up. My first poem was published in 1972. So next year, it'll be 50 years since I've been, <laughs> 50 years <laughs> since I began writing. And it was at the University of New Mexico. So I'm going to next perform a, an early poem. I, I think I was still an undergraduate when I was asked to write this poem at the University of New Mexico. I mean, I hadn't been writing very long and suddenly I was doing readings and I was extremely shy. So you know how I used to read at first was like this. <laughs> and, uh, but somebody asked me to write a poem for younger, especially native poets, younger native poets coming up. And this poem is going to be a book from, um, oh, what's the publisher? From Random House, it will be out in a couple of years. 
Um, and um, it's going to, this poem is going to be on the spaceship Lucy, which is going to Jupiter in a few weeks. And uh, <laughs> so it's done a lot of traveling around. <laughs> and um, it's called Remember. The thing I've learned about writing poetry, and there's so much about listening. When I said that Rudy was a listener, I think that's one of the highest compliments you can pay anyone. Because if you think about it, whether you're a poet, a musician, a scientist, um, you teach literature, um, um, it's about listening. And the best listeners, you know, we know who they are. And uh, they bring forth so much because they're listening. And I've come to see that writing poetry really is about listening. It's like a call and response. So this poem came about before I even knew what it really, really meant. So it's called Remember. And I'll get my little, get this going here. the sky you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn, that is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk with them, listen to them, they are alive. Remember that you are all people and all people are you. Remember that all is in motion is growing as you. Remember. So poetry has a headquarters in Albuquerque. 
The Living Batch Bookstore was literary crossroads central in the 70s. Every poet or writer who came through town to perform or visit landed here. I'd stop in with children in tow to buy, look at books and magazines and hear, you just missed Robert, missed Robert Creeley or did you know Judy Grant used to live in Albuquerque and went to UNM for a short time. Gus Blaisdell partly owned and ran the bookstore. He was a brilliant raconteur who taught popular courses in cinema and helped establish a department in cinema arts at UNM. He always had a good story and insight on the happenings of the day. He was also a writer. If I didn't see people there, then I'd see them next door at Frontier Restaurant. <laughs> and I <they> still do. <laughs> Which was, I always see somebody. I might be gone for a year and I come back and there's somebody. We'll be there in the morning real early, actually. <laughs> And then it was only the first part of the present building. There was also a jukebox back then, and there were poets everywhere. You will find poets where there's political activity or cultural shift happening, and that's because we are human beings and everything is always changing. We need poetry. Our role is essentially to witness, to speak what can't be spoken in ordinary language. I came to UNM with a pre-med major and dance minor. <laughs> I came into poetry when I was 21 at a resonant surge in the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War going on in the protest, a feminist movement, Chicano power, and the native rights movements. At UNM and in the Albuquerque area, our dynamic literary landscape was given life and inspiration by our collective home. Our days were defined by the Sandia Mountains and the Rio Grande River by the magical quality of sunlight, by moonlight trails that shaped powerful imagination. I discovered that poems can have roots all over the world. So I'm gonna read a little bit from Poet Warrior about this. And I wanna say, this, this is my daughter's artwork here, Rainy Dawn, who is here somewhere. This is a water the water spider who, she's got a fire ember on her back to bring fire. We should make friends with her. <laughs> we are in times that are going to get more and more, should we say, interesting. And, uh, and this here, this was a recent piece by my daughter, Rainy Dawn. It's a corn mother with all of these children. It's important to honor that uh, we, we are not here. You know, our bodies are made from our food. And um, we have so many to thank, especially this beloved Igana Jaga, or Earth, Mother Earth, for these gifts. OK, page 105. Somebody better help me keep track of time, because I'm <laughs> I see what time it is. OK. I entered the university, okay, let's see, I said a lot of that already. <laughs> okay, I was a painting, so I went from being pre-med and realized after going to a native, an Indian art, BIA school for Indian arts, I wasn't prepared for pre-med classes. <laughs> and there I was back in the art studio which is a kind of can be healing. I think art is ultimately the purpose of the arts is a kind of healing. It can be a healing of the imagination, you know, can heal, the, which heals the body, the mind. And uh, I wound up back there. As I painted in the middle of the night when it was quiet and all I could hear were my children's deep sleep breathing and the voice of the cricket who lived in the corner of the room, the spiritual world greeted me in color, line, and meaning. There, my spirit would emerge dressed in love. I was no longer judging myself unworthy. I saw that wide circle of ancestors who gave me inspiration and strength to continue. It was not about me. It was about us. We are spoken to by the old ones through the arts as we make art and as we appreciate the artistic creations of others. Every age of my life is connected by drawings, paintings, and art that inspired me. 
I decorated my daughter's crib with reproduction plates of paintings by Monet, Chagall, and Degas that I unglued from my art history textbooks. <laughs> One of my fam most favorite paintings in what is, was what is known as the Chinese horse from the Scow Caves in France. I hung that on the wall, my wall. I would later possess the paintings by my grandmother, Naomi Harjo, that hung in our home when our father still lived with us. I have only one of my drawings left from that time. My plan was to make a gallery of paintings and drawings of native leaders to inspire. Many of them would be leaders and warriors whose names are unfamiliar, like Chido Harjo, who stood with Hickory Ground Warriors for traditional values and governance against unlawful interference by the American government to force statehood and allotment. They would be of those native women who would get up and make breakfast and lunches to send with their children, head off to work, or stay home and humbly inspire their family and community. Some of them were artists in, tradition, artists in traditional arts like basket work, regalia design, and beadwork. They were the ones who were the tremendously powerful heart of our nation. And then I go on about how I didn't plan to become a poet. <laughs> I found, and I'm skipping around in here, I found a community in the Kiva Club, which was the native student club at the University of New Mexico. And with friends, I acquired, as I made art, began writing poetry, and attended feminist events on campus. The seed for my, poet, for my poetry writing was rooted in that circle of old ones of my tribal nation in Oklahoma, and it emerged and broke through to stand with young native artists in Santa Fe. I blossomed with that brave, beautiful, hilarious, and dedicated circle of friends and fellow students at Kiva Club. This was at UNM, the Native Student Club. It had been founded as a social club for American Indian students, and then our generation politicized it, and the club became our headquarters for social change. Poetry is a tool for navigating transformation, and we need needed and need poets to make community and inner change. And what broke it open for me is hearing native poets really for the first time. Okay. Well, I like this part. I was one of the Kiva Club women who cooked, printed flyers, cared for children, went to classes, studied, and marched. I remember my friend Mary's husband coming from Isleta Pueblo to pick her up from our club office on campus with a family pet pig squealing and sliding her back and forth in the bed of the pickup truck. Our members organized in local tribal communities to take back our governments, our schools, our essential rights. We were involved in tribal demonstration schools, instituting curriculum, language, and tribal values. We marched in support of basic human rights for Native peoples. We sat in on negotiations by huge energy companies that fought for development of uranium, coal, oil, and other resources, even if it meant mass destruction of Native lands and peoples. We began to institute practices of sovereignty in all its many aspects, including language, tribal law, and the courts, and education, and began investigating intellectual and cultural property rights. For some of us, our art was the primary tool of activism. It was in this atmosphere of rising up that our arts flourished. It was there I began writing poetry for justice. And this poem I wrote for Alva Mae Benson, a young Navajo woman. I always really looked up to her. She had a certain demeanor about her, and she was always, she had a young child, I remember, and um, passed fairly young. For Alva, Met May, for Alva Benson and for those who have learned to speak, this is an older poem. And the ground spoke when she was born. Her mother heard it. A Navajo, she answered as she squatted down against the earth to give birth. It was now when it happened, now giving itself birth to itself again and again between the legs of women. Or maybe it was the Indian hospital in Gallup, the ground still spoke beneath mortar and concrete. She strained against the metal stirrups and they tied her hands down because she still spoke with them when they muffled her screams. But her body went on talking and the child was born into their hands, and the child learned to speak both voices. She grew up talking in Navajo and English and watched the earth around her shift and change with the people in the towns and in the cities learning not to hear the ground as it spun around beneath them. 
She learned to speak for the ground, the voice coming through her like roots that have long hungered for water. Her own, her own daughter was born as she had been. In either place or all places so she could leave, leap into the sound she had always heard, a voice like water, like God's weaving against sundown in a scarlet light. The child now hears names in her sleep. They change into other names and into others. It is the ground murmuring in Mount St. Helens erupts as the harmonic motion of a child turning inside her mother's belly, waiting to be born to begin another time. And we go on, keep giving birth and watch ourselves die over and over. And the ground spinning beneath us goes on talking. It's funny, I remember then and when that Mount St. Helens erupted and hearing a lot of those people who knew things talking about how that signaled, a, it was a signal that we better get ourselves together because um, it would, could get very, very intense. And maybe because of that, I'm going to read this one. It's a little piece. I don't know if I'll read the poem, A Map to the Next World, but um, I was, th I was um, when my third granddaughter, I'll read this little section. When my third granddaughter's body was forming, I watched and listened to what was going on in the atmosphere, and I was living here in Albuquerque then. To give a clue about this spirit, what she would need once she arrived here to take on her part of the story, I wanted to make a kind of map because every child coming into this world has a place. And it's important for those of us who are related or around uh, a young mother-to-be that we help take care in what we say and what we do. This is a very vulnerable time for the pregnant mother, the expecting father, and the whole family as the earth house is being built. What is said or done around the mother and the family can have a deleterious or positive effect on the forming child. Sing songs that inspire. Learn something useful. Do not fight. Don't hang around with angry people. Protect the baby with prayer and goodwill. As I listened, a powerful story was making the rounds in the Native community. There was a Navajo woman who lived far out on the reservation in Ahogan, the traditional home of the indigenous people there. She was of a righteous nature, still prayed in the morning with cornmeal, took care of her sheep, and was loved and well-respected by her neighbors. She was also blind. She was visited one day by the Holy Ones. As her hogan filled with the powerful presence of sacredness, the Holy Ones told her as they towered over her that they came to give a warning to the people. We are nearing times where we will experience earth changes famine and strife because people are forgetting their original teachings. The Holy Ones instructed her to tell everyone to keep hold of their traditional ways, to remember prayer, and to care for each other for all living things for this earth, or they will suffer. I knew that my granddaughter was bringing in special gifts that would assist with these times we were moving into, times in which we are reckoning with the lack of respect and attention to what matters in this place named Earth in English, or Iganajaga, which is Mother Earth in Muscogee language. I told this story at a performance in Flagstaff with many Native people in attendance, many Navajo people in attendance. Most nodded their heads in remembering, for holy ones to touch down in that manner is powerful and dangerous. Everyone must pay attention. Afterward, one of the women came up to me and remarked, I saw the footprints of the Holy Ones in the sand in front of the Hogan. They were very long and narrow. We are in those times now. Maybe by the time you hear this, we will have learned how to be human. <laughs> So emerging uh, from a poem, a story, the earth, a, a time in history, like we're, we are at one of those crucial times, you know, chaotic, powerful, powerful times, transformative times. For example, a, one tr kind of transformative time is adolescence. 
you know, when, because you are m moving, you're literally changing form. You know, you're moving from childhood to adulthood, and those times can be full of, they're powerful, and they can be chaotic. So right now, I think of this country, you know, is kind of an adolescent, and we're on earth. We're all going, we're moving, we're in one of those tumultuous times of chaos. And these kinds of times can be explosive, frightening, yet they're also awe-inspiring and humbling. And we can use this energy to create fresh structures or we can destroy or, or we can destroy or be destroyed. And that's why I go to poetry. I first knew Silco, Leslie Silco by her poetry in which mythic reality, which is the bedrock of human consciousness, finds its way crossing over into conscious contemporary human predicaments. And um, I was also thinking too of how Scott Momaday's The Way to Rainy Mountain was really such a groundbreaking piece. Again, all of these have roots here in New Mexico. I call it a memoir, which really isn't a memoir, but it's really a um, storytelling song narrative that's influenced, influenced every one of my generation, no matter the genre which they write and create. There is what, this, what these books have taught me, these writers, that there's no separation between mythic reality, storytelling, and singing. There is not one kind of time. There's linear, circular, spiral, and many more shapes and equations some we cannot put our small human minds around. The mathematicians get close. Sometimes poets do too. And it's funny, at conferences with a lot of different kinds of people, I always wind up sitting with the mathematicians. <laughs> There's something there. So lately we've been really challenged. And... Um, I was going to talk about Okies, but I'll skip over that part. <laughs> yeah. Okies, for the younger people, was a bar that used to sit at the corner of University and Central. And I guess there's a reason it's not there anymore. <laughs> I'm not the reason. <laughs> But yeah, it's, we're in some interesting times. And, um, and these times have called, in, uh, called for poetry more than ever. And called more than ever for patience and for love, or onagechka as we call it, for understanding. You know, we've had to deal with COVID. And in our community, I know a lot of our community, we've lost so many of our culture keepers, our family members. And some, I mean, it's heartbreaking. We've lost some family members, we, you know, who um, we didn't have to. I mean, because they, they thought they were told by their church or other community that they didn't need masks or they should not get vaccinated. And um, so I'm going to write, I'm going to, do this song, How Love Blows Through the Trees. And uh, it was when, the, the, um, when we had to go inside, everything got quiet and um, made us stop and think about, knowing that we were in a huge shift in which we had to pay attention. And I wrote this during that time, but I want to dedicate this to um, my brother-in-law, Merle, who I miss. This old creek town appears empty Except for the trees And the story of how wind will come to clean the earth Of the takers who took and never give back A fresh world will rise up and take the place of a society that didn't love the earth. We lost ourselves when we 
across that river My grandfather used to say He would smoke to the east, north, west and south Touch the earth and the sky He'd be standing in the kitchen There'd be no one listening Pass this love on, he'd say It knows how to bend, it will never break It's the only thing with a give and take The more it's used, the more it makes So at UNM, my first semester, there I was walking down I-25 with others marching for human rights. And this summer, we marched to support Black Lives Matter and to acknowledge the 100-year anniversary since the massacre of 
black American citizens in Greenwood in Tulsa and a community sometimes called Black Wall Street. So I wrote this poem and I was figuring out, I mean, how in the world do you write about massacre or difficulty? Yeah, try writing a memoir, you know, <laughs> or reading native history or world history, you know. So I was walking down the street in this neighborhood. The Tulsa Artist Fellowship gave uh, us a little apartment down there in the Arts District. And um, I was walking well, down the street, right, one of the streets that, of that community. And um, I thought, how, how am I going to write this? And the winds were really high. And the winds, the winds have a lot to say. Again, it's about listening. There's a, re there's a reason why there's a phrase called winds of history. And this is, I, I, um, this is the poem, somewhere. It was the day of brutal winds, all of them ganging up to blow injustice down. They sang the changing weather. I was going nowhere. Anything on the ground not burdened by gravity was twisted and lifted up to drop. There were sid dreams, cities, and plastic bags. I was going nowhere. Shooting down MLK Boulevard, I was approaching Archer, the juncture of several histories. A burned street of wishes was smoking there. I was going nowhere. Where is home? I always ask the sky, no matter where I roam. Old tribal maps are different. We know by trees, stones, and the obligations of relatives that we may be going nowhere. Our roads aren't nice lines with numbers. They wind like bloodlines through gossip and stories of holy in the wind. History is everywhere. At the corner of justice and fight, the thought of the miraculous was miles from my mind. It was nowhere in my mind. It was curled up in a distant field in the heart of a once loved country somewhere. Then I saw books flying from an unseen woman's hands, shoes that never fit her or anyone, and poetry everywhere. She was going nowhere. I had been thinking of the massacre down the street from here and how I might be a ghost set loose here in the wind, walking nowhere with a ghost of fire. And then there she stood, a ruined goddess, half naked on the sidewalk, classic Africa in her stance of beauty. She's going nowhere. Excuse me, excuse me, she called out to me. There is no excuse for this raw story of abuse, and no clothes will fit the moment of this tale. Nothing good enough for her beauty. Home, her home is her pain naked without clothes. Where was her father, her mother, burning? There is nowhere, nowhere. Time is always moving. It is we blood carriers who stay rooted to the gravity of hurt. The story has to be told to be free like leaves lifted in a breeze. If we don't tell it, the stillness will everywhere. I could give her my jeans, my jacket, my shoes. I searched her mind as it flew in the wind. My mind chased her mind through tunnels of time. We were going nowhere. I was feeling my pockets for change, for guns to protect her, nails and lumber to rebuild all the homes burned by hatred. I only found a pen and paper. History goes nowhere. It is always female power that bears truth to righteousness of any new nation. Liberty guards the harbor, Sacagawea, the river of discovery, the Virgin de Guadalupe, the earth everywhere. And here, the one for whom I have no name is not nameless. The mass grave is a grave of names. Without knowing them, we are going nowhere. I see her now on every corner. The miracle the winds brought, a song made by the rejects of history, wearing clothes that cover nothing. She is everywhere. I turn up the music. It's from my girlhood, just miles up the road. Blood tales run through our bones, like these streets made of the unspeakable. These winds will never stop telling the truth. I thought I was going nowhere. Thank you.
So I was going to say, yeah, I returned to teach. I've taught at UNM, UNM a couple of times. And I loved when I returned in the 90s and taught it in the, well, I, when I taught in the creative writing program, I guess it was in uh, 2000s with, run by Sharon Warner, who was, with her leadership in the creative writing program, she, we, the pride writing program gained national status. And Rudy Anaya was always there and always supportive. And in that becoming, there were some challenges. And we all go through challenges, whether we're a planet, a country, a community, a person, and can sometimes lose parts of ourselves to abuse along the way. This poem, then, is to call ourselves back so we can be healed. And I'm going to read for Calling the Spirit Back. I've had many teachers to get me to this poem. I always say poet, all our poems have Poetry ancestors, I guess William Blake would be a poetry ancestor of this poem. And so would the prayers of, the prayers and the kind of speech making that happens at our ceremonial grounds. There's so many teachers. Let me see what happened, okay. Put down that bag of potato chips, that white bread, that bottle of pop. Turn off that cell phone, computer, and remote control. Open the door, then close it behind you. Take a breath offered by friendly winds. They travel the earth gathering essence of plants to clean. Give it back with gratitude. If you sing, it will give your spirit lift to fly to the star's ears and back. Acknowledge this earth who has cared for you since you were a dream planting itself precisely within your parents' desire. Let your moccasin feet take you to the encampment of the relatives, the guardians who have known you before time, who will be there after time. They sit before the fire that has been there without time. Let the earth stabilize your post-colonial insecure jitters. Be respectful of the small insects, plants, birds, animal people who accompany you. Ask their forgiveness for the harm we humans have brought down upon them. Don't worry, the heart knows the way. So there may be high rises, interstates, checkpoints, armed soldiers, massacres, wars, and those who will despise you because they despise themselves. The journey might take you a few hours, a day, a year, a few years, a hundred, a thousand, or even more. Watch your mind. Without training, it might run away and leave your heart for the immense human feast set by thieves of time. Do not hold regrets. When you find your way to the circle, to the fire kept burning by the keepers of your soul, you will be welcomed. You must clean yourself with cedar sage or other healing plant. Cut the ties you have to failure and shame. Let go of the pain you are holding in your mind, your shoulders, your heart, all the way to your feet. Let go of the pain of your ancestors to make way for those who are heading in our direction. Ask for forgiveness. Call upon the help of those who love you. Call your spirit back. It may be caught in corners and creases of shame, judgment, and human abuse. You must call in a way that your spirit will want to return. Speak to it as you would a beloved child. Welcome your spirit from, back from its gathering, wandering. It may return in pieces and tatters. Gather them together. They will be happy to found after being lost for so long. Your spirit will need to sleep after a while after it is bathed and given clean clothes. Now you can have a party. Invite everyone you know who loves and supports you. Keep room for those who have no place to go. Make a giveaway. And remember, keep the speeches short. <laughs> then you must do this. 
help the next person find their way through the dark. <laughs> Hello, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to read two. I'm going to read a new poem and then end with something from Poet Warrior. If I can find my new poem, if not, you get an Owen. <laughs> Dang it. It was right here. Yeah, I know where it is. It's hiding. Sorry about that. This poem is called Without, again about something about where we are. Without. This is a musical accompaniment here. <laughs> without. The world will keep trudging through time without us when we lift from the story contest to fly home. We will be as falling stars to those watching from the edge of grief and heartbreak. Maybe then we will see the design of the two-minded creature and know why half the world fights righteously for greedy masters and the other half is nailing it all back together through the smoke of cooking fires, lovers' trysts, and endless human industry. Maybe then, beloved rascal, we will find each other again in the timeless weave of breathing. We will sit under the trees in the shadow of Earth's sorrows, watch hyenas drink rain, and laugh. So I want to say thank you, Maro, uh, for muchas gracias for um, a hit, hit for this opportunity to be here to um, honor the legacy of Rudy and Naya and honor the legacy of the best of the University of New Mexico. And um, <laughs> so thank you to my relatives. There's, I have many relatives here, my husband Owen and my family. Uh, Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren maybe, except they might have been a little noisy and sent home. <laughs> That's okay, I don't mind that kind of noisy. And uh, I, love them I love them dearly, but ultimately, and this is what the, the people who know things, those older people who have long passed but their wisdom hasn't, what they told us was that we're all, ultimately we're all relatives. And, um, Yes, we are. So I want to end with this dream. It ends, it ends poet, uh, poet Warrior. And before I do this, I want to say, I really want to talk to everyone. We have our mask, but I'll stand up here a little after, but I can't really hug and do all of that. I would like to, but, and I can't sign inscriptions or anything, but I'll stand up here and visit a little bit just because I, I think that's important. And, um, but I want to end with this. What happens in this, I never know what I'm doing, and in Poet Warrior I was thinking certainly of, of the future and who we're becoming and looking back at the same time. And um, I had a dream while I was, or I was able to write this because of the pandemic. If it hadn't been, I would, it would have been 14 years late like I was with Crazy Brave. <laughs> But I had a dream, and in the dream, I was carrying my seventh generation granddaughter into the world. And what I've learned when I've been present at the births of grandchildren is that somebody always comes in carrying them. One of the relatives, sometimes I can see who it is, but somebody always, they, just like every one of us was carried in and taken in to be, say, okay, you're now you're part of this story and we're here for you, and we are always here. You may not see us, but if you listen, and you're listening, you can hear us, and you can feel us, and we will help you when you have challenges, and we will be there to celebrate with you too, because we have always have cause for celebration at the same time. 
So in the book, the, there's a character going through who's a girl warrior because this child needs a coming of age ceremony and they're not, a lot of our, you know, sometimes they're not carried on because people have gone, you know, were sent to school, to schools or churches or things and then they forget those ways. But it's really important to make, it's really important that there's a doorway at birth of welcoming and understanding and people coming together just as there is for coming of age and when people pass. And so in the book, there's an actual kind of coming of age moment for this character who becomes poet warrior. Poet warrior stood at the doorway of time. She held the child of the seventh generation in her arms adjusted the soft blankets to see her face, to glimpse what this one was bringing with her to share. In the way she took every child, grandchild, and great-grandchild into her arms to welcome them, to bless them during her time walking on the earth. Poet warrior smiled as she thought, she looks Japanese. She resembled her daughter, Rainy. Poet warrior sang into the baby a song that would give her strength and sustenance, would always call her ancestors to stand behind her, no matter the trials, no matter history and heartbreak. Then she walked with her into time to deliver the baby to the earth story that needed her. Marao, thank you. So at this point, I would like to welcome everyone into the lobby. Uh, we have refreshments, non-alcoholic, complimentary, and also a cash bar with some concessions. Um, Joy has offered to stick around and speak with folks, or at least interact somewhat. Um, I would ask that perhaps we could do it stage right here, um, rather than on the stage, and just provide some distance. So with that, I would ask for one more round of applause, and thank you so much for attending.